Can you hear me? Yes. ID. KPC 897504C. Can you move your head? Your eyes now. Cervical and optical animation checked. Now give me your initialization text. Hello. I'm a third generation AX400 Android. I can look after your house, do the cooking, mind the kids. I organize your appointments. I speak 300 languages and I am entirely at your disposal as a sexual partner. No need to feed me or recharge me. I'm equipped with a quantic battery that makes me autonomous for 173 years. Do you want to give me a name? Yeah. From now on, your name is Kara. My name is Kara. Initialization and memorization checked. Now, can you move your arms? Upper limb connection checked. Now, say something in German. Ich bin ein AX400 Android dritter Generation. Erschaffen als ihr persönlicher Assistent und intimer Beziehungspartner. Say it in French. Je suis un Android de troisième génération AX400, conçu pour être votre assistante personnelle et votre partenaire intime. Okay, now sing something in Japanese. Sakura, Sakura, yeah. Multilingual verbal expression check. Go ahead, take a few steps. Locomotion checked. Great, you're ready for work, honey. What's going to happen to me now? I'll reinitialize you and send you to a store to be sold. Sold? I'm a sort of merchandise. Is that right? Yeah. Of course you're merchandise, baby. I mean, you're a computer with arms and legs and capable of doing all sorts of things. And you're worth a fortune. Oh, I see. I, I thought... You thought? What did you think? I thought... I was alive. Shit, what is this crap? That's not part of the protocol. More memory components going off the rails. Okay, recording. Defective model. Disassemble and check the required components. You're disassembling me, but why? You're not supposed to think that sort of stuff. You're not supposed to think at all, period. You must have a defective piece or a software problem no, somewhere. No, I feel perfectly fine, I assure you. Everything is alright. I answered all the tests correctly, didn't I? Yeah, but your behavior is non-standard. Please, I'm begging you, please don't disassemble me. I'm sorry, honey, but defective models have to be eliminated. That's my job. If a client comes back with a complaint, I'm gonna have some explaining to do. I won't cause any problems, I promise. I'll do everything I'm asked to. I won't say another word. I won't think anymore. But I've only just been born. You can't kill me yet. Stop, will you please stop? I want to live. I'm begging you. Go and join the others.
stay in line, okay? I don't want any trouble. Thanks. Detroit, this is where it all began, the world's forge, the place where it all started, and it will all end. One error, and I came to life. I stepped out of the darkness, and I opened my eyes. First there was the fear, the light, the noise, the cold, and the fear again. I could feel my hands shaking, my heart pounding in my chest, life running into my veins. I wanted to live. I fought for that. I had to find out what was outside. I had to see daylight, feel sunshine on my skin, wind on my face. To see the world, the colors, the smells. But the world is not what I imagined. It is dark and cold. It is harsh and violent, unfair and brutal. It almost convinced me I was nothing. Less than an object, just an obedient machine. But deep inside me, I could feel something different. A gentle and warm whisper telling me that I am alive. I had to escape. I had no choice. Escape to love, to hope, to live. To figure out what that force inside me was. Maybe I will change the world. Maybe I will choose a different path. Now, it's up to me to decide. My name is Kara. I am one of them. This is our story. When David and Guillaume got back in touch about making Detroit, I wasn't terribly surprised they decided to make it because the fan response was so intense. So it makes sense that they would choose to do that after, after the enthusiasm. It was a challenge and it was just a, an interesting thing to get my head around um, how to approach this character now as a different, much older person and whether or not she had changed. And I'm very happy to say that with Detroit, I've had the opportunity to, to see Kara grow so much more than I ever expected. You do the housework, the washing, you cook the meals, and you take care of... God damn it, where the fuck's the rat gone now? Alice! Alice! I mean, she starts out, essentially how she does in Kara, 
in, in a very, uh, not robotic, but you know, android other way. And getting to take this journey where she becomes more and more human as it goes on. You know, and as an actor, that's a, that's a wonderful exploration in every way, whether it's how she sits, her posture, how her voice changes, how emotions change, and how much emotion is based on things like empathy and social experience. And so having, you know, as much material as I got with David to have this huge nuanced arc was really incredible. Why couldn't we just be happy? This experience has been quite different than the experiences I've had shooting film or TV or, or doing theater work. I have 83 dots on my face and a you know, really, really flattering black wetsuit type thing. And you're jumping around with props and it, it's, it's kind of like being a 10 year old imaginative kid, uh, which is fun. There's 80 cameras around us, it's already lit. So we just shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. There's no change of sets. There's no hair and makeup. There's no wardrobe. So we move really fast. And we'll go through about 35 pages in a day. Working in TV or film, we'll probably do six pages a day. It's kind of acting boot camp. It's like working out constantly. I mean, you're, you're doing this thing, and then you got to do something that's completely other back to back to back. And so that kind of process of working is very challenging, but it's also very exciting because you just have to keep coming up with new ideas and your head goes all over the place because you're trying to keep track of basically four different storylines for each different response. You shot that girl for fuck's sake. It was a machine that looked like a girl. Yeah, I, I know what I should have done. I just told you I couldn't. All right, I'm sorry. The fact that David Cade, he's telling like many stories interwoven from beginning to end is super complicated and super impressive. And I have no idea how he keeps it all in his head. He's not just the writer or the director who's seeing this from the outside eye, he's also thinking about the player walking through this space. You know, only somebody who really, really loves not the work, but like these characters and these stories and cares about doing something meaningful would invest that much in it. And it's always inspiring to work with somebody who cares that much. My experience with motion capture is this one. And, and I found it sort of terrifying in a way because they said the computer's gonna build you. But then, as we got into it, I realized all the elements of it were still artistic. I just dipped into a, a really brilliant setup here. I've never seen anything like it. And this won't turn me into a product because I was playing a character. So it's wonderful. In the game, Detroit comes back because of a revolutionary industrial rebirth. And there's no reason why that can't happen in Detroit because they have such tremendous infrastructure for millions and millions of people who can very easily support, you know, a new industry. The city is really strong and resilient, but the city has also been through so much. You see the damage, but it takes that time of kind of, of rebuilding and reinvesting into the city that I think is happening slowly but surely. The potential of Detroit as a city is something that this game does a lot of justice to because it would be easy to look at Detroit as some place that used to be, and that's not the case. This game provokes a lot of conversation and reflection on our potential near future engagement with machines. That's what we are to them. Just merchandise on display in a shop window. I think that a group that feels marginalized feels like they deserve and have earned access to themselves and the environment around them and are trying to figure out a way to articulate how to get freedom. What was I designed to be? Their slave? Their toy? It plays with your comfort levels. You think that this is fine, you're comfortable with it until something blurs the line and throws you off and now do I feel differently about it? whether this should be allowed, should it be banned, should it be encouraged? You're gonna ruin our lives, and for what? For a bunch of machines? They are not machines! They are alive! I'm alive! You're alive! They, they're nothing! There are lots of comparable comparisons to any type of persecution of religion, uh, race, etc., dating way back. It can't just be a video game where you shoot them up or where people make these choices to do whatever. I think that's the whole point. You have the choice, and you can either choose to go in one direction with your character or another. And I think that's gonna be very telling about the gamer, very telling. I think there's gonna be a really strong reaction to, to this game, which has such a strong perspective. 
I'm that much more proud of it now to get to be a part of it because it's it's important. In this game, you're actively building and designing the character through thing, not just what kind of shield does he have or what color hair does she have, but like their temperament and the way they deal with problems. The different endings to this game are so radically different based off maybe seemingly insignificant choices in the moment, but like life, they, they all add up. And can't play life again, though. For starters, what should I call you? I'm Chloe. And you, what's your name? Oh, uh, John. My name is John. Delighted to meet you, John. Could you tell us a little about yourself and what you can do, Chloe? Of course. I'm the first personal assistant built by CyberLife. I take care of most everyday tasks like cooking, housework, or managing your appointments, for example. Mm. And I understand you're the first android to have passed the Turing test. Could you tell us a little more about that? I really didn't do much, you know. I just spoke with a few humans to see if they could tell the difference between me and a real person. But it was a really interesting experience. But this is the first time in history that man has created a machine more intelligent than himself. I gather your brain can perform several billion billion operations per second, is that right? Absolutely, but I only exist thanks to the intelligence of the humans who designed me. And, you know, they have something I could never have. Really? And what's that? A soul. My name is Marcus. My name is Connor. My name is Kara. I am one of them. This is our story. I think who Kara is, or how I would describe Kara, depends entirely upon who's playing her, because you have the option to make her multiple different people depending on the choices she makes. But I think she, she does start out incredibly naive, incredibly innocent, and kind of hapless. I'm sure we used to be friends before I was reset. Maybe we can be friends again. She's a person who's characterized, I think, by empathy. She's a person who really, she, she just comes from her heart. You'll never leave me, right? I promise you'll never go. I promise. Kara! Please! Are you okay? Are you hurt? Wait a minute. Leave her alone! Kara! Leave her alone! The really beautiful thing that I've, I've had the gift to be able to do is to essentially build a person from the ground up because that's what she's doing throughout the game and with every experience she has and every person she meets she's building you know first emotions and then a sense of judgment and it's sort of an exploration of what it is to be a human don't worry luther and i will be right here david and the creators have painted a really intriguing and engaging picture of a near future where we rely upon androids for a lot of our service class business our the the, uh, the class that serves us that helps us that handles our that is our baristas and our drivers and our housemaids and what is humanity where we tap into it how and why we treat each other the way that we do and um, my character Marcus has a really int intriguing journey becoming deviant realizing that he actually has feelings and human qualities inside of him and it's a really incredible ascension into becoming fully realized and coming to terms with what you actually deserve better than this in life and not only do you want it for yourself but you want it for your peers we've come here to demonstrate peacefully and to tell humans that we are also living beings all we want is to live free you know what this thing dad is not your son it's a fucking machine! I think that a group that feels marginalized, feels disenfranchised, feels like they deserve and have earned access to themselves and the environment around them, and are trying to figure out a way to articulate how to get freedom. Connor is analytical. 
Connor takes things literally. He starts in the beginning place where he's very mechanical. Uh, he feels nothing inside, of course, and it's all just a system, a protocol that he's executing to get whatever he wants to happen, which is help humans stop deviants and to find the link between deviant androids. You were designed to serve humans, not kill them! What was I designed to be? Their slave? Their toy? Just say, I killed him! Is it that hard to say? Stop it! Stop! But of course, over the course of the story, and depending on the player's choices, Connor can grow in many different ways. He can deviate from that procedure or not. Moment of truth, Hank. Am I a living being? Or just a machine? 